the uh, screen is not working this morning, the projector is not working this morning, so um, I'm going to, as always, and my goal, especially with this sermon, was to shut up and let God speak. So uh, we, last, the end of last week, uh, we found that there were, Jeremiah was very clear, was he not? Uh, and again, my purpose in showing you going in chapter order is to show you that Jeremiah was saying something, and he was saying it over and over again, right? Uh, because although as a church we generally study the book of Jeremiah once every five to six years, uh, studying the lesson you've probably never picked up on this theme that clearly is something that Jeremiah is saying because it's chapter after chapter, uh, but perhaps if you've never read the book of Jeremiah for yourself, you might have never seen that. Likewise, I'm going through Desire of Ages, and although I skipped a little bit, uh, largely I'm going, you know, kind of in sequential order because this is a theme that she wrote about. Though, you, unless you read the book and are paying attention, you'll never pick this up probably from just, you know, a study of Desire of Ages. But there is a class, she said, who are not openly attacking the Word of God, but are explaining it so as to destroy its force. And again, I ask you to think, because, again, a lot of times when we read things in Desire of Ages or Great Controversy so forth, we assume when she's talking about church leaders that she's talking about leaders out there. Perhaps the papal church, perhaps the daughter churches. Uh, but I think a lot of times if you'll go back and read and think for yourself, you'll understand, no, no, she's talking about the Israel of God. Right? Okay? Uh, because again, the fallen churches are telling you that the law of God has been done away with. It's nailed to the cross. But in this passage, it's very clear. She's saying, no, no, they're not making open and avowed. They're not attacking the law openly. They're just explaining it in ways that destroy its force. And I showed you last week that one of the guys that teaches at one of our colleges, you know, he's going to show you how to read certain Bible passages so that they affirm certain lifestyles that I think Old and New Testament very clearly call sin. But he's going to teach you how to read it in a way that it actually affirms these lifestyles. Desire of Ages, page 412, says, The opposition and misrepresentation of the priests and rulers, while it could not turn them, speaking of the disciples, away from Christ, it still caused them great perplexity. They did not see their way clearly. The influence of their early training, the teaching of the rabbis, the teachers in Israel, those who write the morning watch, those who write all the books that we love to grab from the ABC, the influence of, the, of those people, the power of tradition, still intercepted their view of truth. So here you have the Son of God speaking directly to men for three and a half years, but he's not able to get through to them because this, the sophistries of the rabbis, the teachers, have so fogged up their mind that even the Word of God made incarnate is having difficulty penetrating to their brains. Again, as I say all the time, there is nothing, I don't say it, as the wise man says, there is nothing new under the sun. That which hath been is that which shall be. As the Bible and spirit of prophecy make so clear, all the things that are written in God's word are written as prophecies and samples, and they are written most specifically for those living at the end of the world. Because when judgment moves from the dead to the living, God cannot afford to have his people living in a fog. Amen? 
we're going to have to be extraordinarily clear-headed. Does anyone here want to be clear-headed? Yes. Well, then you need to avoid the teaching of the rabbis, according to Jesus. Okay? Desire in Ages, page 415, the hatred of the priests and rabbis would never be overcome. That, sorry, that the, the hatred of the priests and rabbis would never be overcome. That Christ would be rejected by his own nation, denomination. Israel of the last days is not a nation, but a denomination. That the hatred of the priests and rabbis would never be overcome. That Christ would be rejected by his own nation, condemned as a deceiver, and crucified as a male factor. Such a thought the disciples had never entertained. But the hour of the power of darkness was drawing on, and Jesus must open to his disciples the conflict before them. Jesus had to make his disciples aware of what was causing them problem. He had to open their mind. They, they could never contemplate that his, God's own church would turn against him. They would never contemplate that surely the leaders will come around. Jesus is getting down the crunch time and he's looking at his men, these men who will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I pray that each of us might be filled with latter rain Holy Spirit power. But it's coming to crunch time and Jesus looks around and says, I have got to get them to understand that if they keep listening, they will say crucify them. I get in trouble, so I'll... I had to unexpectedly go to Houston this week. And Monday morning, I was in an Adventist home, and they said, you know, we have, let's have worship. I, said, I thought, great. Um, so we pulled open what I, I assumed it was a gift, uh, the, the morning watch, I guess it's the current morning watch, uh, written by a current Seventh-day Adventist luminary. And I was hesitant, Malachi was with me, but I thought, okay. So the head of the home started reading, and within two or three sentences, what was saying was false. And I bit my tongue. But within a couple of paragraphs, the falsity of the first few sentences, you know, when you set up a bad premise, what do you think you're going to end up with? And so I, I had to say, well, uh, let's, uh, can I ask you a question? Go back and can you read those couple of sentences at the beginning? And I said, is that true? Well, no. Well, if the basis of the day's lesson is not true, then the lesson is not true. Okay. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware the teaching of these rabbis, because if that's all you're listening to, Jesus, the Bible says, woe to them, but it will also be woe to you. Okay. Desire of Ages, page 450. Jesus' brothers, now speaking of his half-brothers, thought it a mistake for him to alienate the great and learned men of the nation. They felt that these men must be in the right, and that Jesus was at fault in placing himself in antagonism to them. So Jesus' disciples thought, Jesus, can't you just play nice and get along with the rulers? I.e., we want to be in high places in your kingdom, and you need to kind of play along 
with the leaders. Surely they'll come around. Jesus' blood brothers thought, come on, these guys can't, they can't be all this wrong. They're the leaders of Israel. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay? Desire of Ages, page 456. Like a swift flash of light, these words revealed to the rabbis the pit of ruin into which they were about to plunge. Jesus is now coming and he's saying some things directly to them, and they realize that we're on the wrong path. For an instant, they were filled with terror. They saw that they were in conflict with infinite power, but they would not be warned. In order to maintain their influence with the people, their murderous designs must be concealed. If you hear the voice of God this morning, and again, ignore what I say, but if you hear the voice of God this morning, and it sounds like a warning, but you say, well, but be very careful. Because those men were plunging towards ruin, and Jesus was making it clear to them, and it touched, it pricked their hearts, but they, no. They shook off the thought and said, it couldn't possibly. Desire of Ages, page 458 to 459. Many who were convinced that Jesus was the Son of God were misled by the false reasoning of the priests and rabbis. Dot, dot, dot. Had the people in sincerity studied the word for themselves, they would not have been misled. Someone should have said amen. Had the people, had Israelites studied God's word for themselves, they would not have been misled. Many are deceived today in the same way as were the Jews. Religious teachers read the Bible in light of their own understanding and traditions. And there I showed you last week this man who is a teacher in one of our universities saying, you don't have to believe what the Bible writers believed. And you can believe things that they didn't believe. Is this exactly what she has just said? The religious teachers read the Bible in light of their own understanding and traditions. Well, he said, well, they didn't believe in equality, of, you know, women's equality and whatever, so you can... But I'm, I have a higher understanding than the Bible writers, so... Listen to my way of interpretation. This is exactly what she's saying. And the people, religious teachers read the Bible in the light of their own understanding and traditions, and the people do not search the scriptures for themselves and judge for themselves as to what is truth, but they yield up their judgment and they commit their souls to their leaders. And the Seventh-day Adventists we know how true this is because we have see, all probably gone to Revelation seminars and we've seen people listen to the truth, see it for themselves from God's word. And then if you ever talk to the evangelist, at some point they come back one night and they talk to their pastor. And he says, well, that's not what it means. So I'm not, this is going to be my last night here. Because they were looking at it for themselves, and the scripture says just what it means, and it means just what it says. And they understood light, but they went and listened to their leaders. And now the light has become darkness. But folks, it doesn't just happen with folks out there. The preaching and teaching of the word is one of the means that God has ordained for diffusing light, but we must bring every man's teaching to the test of Scripture. You must go home this afternoon and take this list and see how much... I pray that I didn't. But you must know for yourself whether what I read was true, and you've got the citations, you can pull it up on the computer, you can open the Word of God, and you can read the passages and say, that boy was out of his mind. 
Whoever will prayerfully study the Bible, desiring to know the truth that he may obey it, will receive divine enlightenment. Did you hear God's promise? If this afternoon you will go home and read God's word for yourself with the intent to follow what he says, if you will do what I say, you will know the doctrine, then you can understand for yourself. You will receive divine enlightenment. All right. Someone not in here, but someone that may see this will say, enough of that old woman. Enough of the Old Testament. I've heard the words that's been said to me by men of the cloth. Well, Neil, you need to preach more like Jesus. So this morning I'll read you the words of Jesus. From the book of Matthew. Straight from the gospel. Well, what were the words in the beginning? Someone reminds me. Right? As we read Jeremiah, I, and this is why I showed you often the beginning of the chapter, because it, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. We call it the testimony of Jesus, the Bible says, is the spirit of prophecy. Matthew chapter 3. But when he... I'll wait for someone to call. I said I was going to read you the words of Jesus. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, worthy of repentance. Now, someone should have said, Neil, you just lied to us. Those weren't the words of Jesus. I know, it's John the Baptist. Those were the words of John the Baptist. These are the words of the man who would make straight paths for the coming of the Lord. John is a type, Jesus said, of a partial fulfillment of the prophecy that in the last days Elijah will come. To whom did Elijah preach? Moabites? Ammonites? Hittites? To whom did Elijah preach? Israelites. Elijah must come to Israel in the last days to make straight paths for the coming of the Lord. To call Adventism to say, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. And if not, then quit playing. Now, can you imagine John is preaching out there in the desert, and the people are coming, and then the Pharisees and the rabbis start hearing that here's this man causing a little bit of a ruckus. Let's go see exactly what he is up to. And so here comes the conference president, the vice president, the treasurer, and they come out to hear John talking. And John sees them coming and says, Oh, neighbors, how come and sit in the best seats? John looks at the religious leaders and says, Oh, generation of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Excuse me? No, we read these words, folks, and it's just we read them and keep moving. Can you imagine how shocking that would be if something like that happened today? If a luminary walked in through here and someone up in the pulpit said, Generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I'd like to be flying a wall if that happens. More like, what lives did you bring us today? Folks, we need to pray for our leaders, but we also need to be very straight Amen. because they have a soul to save as well. Right. And Nicodemus might have been one of those men. Joseph of Arimathea might have been. Again, I remind you that uh, Nebuchadnezzar will likely be in heaven. You ever pray for the Pope? For the Pope? The head of Rome? The head of Babylon? He 
has a soul to save. That's right. Again, I've heard this often say, we're not talking about people, we're talking about a system. I'm talking about a system this morning. God is trying to warn you about certain systems. Okay? Not talking about people. You need to pray for your conference president. You need to pray for your general conference president. Okay? You need to be wise. Matthew chapter 5, this is Jesus speaking. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of all the people whose books you read, those are the scribes, and the conservatives, well, the conservatives are the good ones. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus said this 2,000 years ago, but these words were recorded for you today, living at the end of time. Because if you don't understand that you're... So often, Ellen White says that the, the, the congregation rarely rises above the level of the pastor. Because if the pastor does it, well, if it's good enough for the pastor, if the pastor's wife does it, then I can do it. no. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. If I ever talk like Jesus, I would be run out of town. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Well, there were lots of priests and rabbis and Pharisees running around. But Jesus looked on the people and thought, I feel so sorry for them because they're as sheep without a shepherd. Are sheep smart animals? No doubt. Yeah. Do they need a shepherd? Yes. The church has how many foundations? One. And it's Jesus Christ, my Lord. Right? That's got to be your foundation. The church is the apple of God's eye. It is the one object on which God bestows his supreme regard. But you never should forget that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. It is his church. He is the good shepherd. Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 5. Now, there, these twelve Jesus sent forth, he's sending out his disciples, and he commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus is sending out his disciples, and to where is he sending them? His own church. To his own church. Do not go in the way of the Samaritans. That's your close relatives, that's the ten northern tribes that have fallen away, the fallen churches. Go specifically and only to Israel. Okay? I skip to verse 14, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words. Where, where are they? Who's not receiving his word? Methodist? Right. Israel. Whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that congregation, for that city. It shall be better when? 
What was Jesus, why was this recorded? For those living in the last days. Jesus said in the day of judgment, when judgment moves from the dead to the living, when a Sunday law is passed, for those who have refused to hear the message before that time, it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah. Anyone know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Better? It would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you understand what's coming? Do you understand the burden of my heart to give the same warning that Jesus gave? Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. He's sending them down to the heart of Chicago to talk to the godless atheists. Send them to the church. He's sending them down to the Adventist churches around East Texas. Around Texas. Be therefore wise as servants and harmless as doves, but beware of men. What men? Murders? False teachers. For they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogue. Who was the greatest? When the, lat, when the early rain fell on the disciples, and they went forward with great power to take the word, who was the first great persecutor of the church? Saul. Well, we hear of Saul in Acts, right? It was the... It was God's church that didn't accept the message. Again, God has two meanings of church. I have a church, but church is those who accept my word and are victorious, those who wrestle with God and prevail. But those who do not, they will deliver you up to councils, they will turn you into Herod, and scourge you in their synagogues. Folks, this thing is written for us living today. And if you don't believe me, again, Jesus just said it would be better in the day of judgment. You see, this applied to the church that would live just after Jesus died. But the primary reason it's written and recorded is for you. Better, better for Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me read this to you from Jeremiah chapter twenty, uh, Jeremiah chapter seven. I read some out of Jeremiah seven last week, but I purposely skipped this because it's. I just, but coming back this week. Let me read you Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 29. Cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away, and take up a lamentation in high places, for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. What's the generation of God's wrath? Unto the third and... Because the fifth ain't coming. Because the Amorites' iniquity is not full, but if by the fourth generation they haven't turned it around, I'm coming back and I will destroy them. We're living in the fourth generation of Adventism and apostasy. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children, verse 30, for the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. Skipping to verse 32. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be called Tophet, 
nor the valley of the son of Hinnom. That was the valley just outside Jerusalem. It's referred to as Gehenna in the New Testament. There was fire always there. It's translated, the word is translated as hell. But it's just outside the gates of Jerusalem. That it shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom. It will be called the valley of slaughter. For they shall bury in Tophet till there be no more place. It goes on, and then it talks about the voice of the bride and the voice, the voice of the bridegroom. Remember, we talked about that a little last time. That's where John picks that up and puts that in Revelation chapter 18. It's talking about the little time of trouble. And God has said in Adventism, there's going to be not place enough to bury Going back to Jesus, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Matthew 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. What did Jesus just call? Preach like Jesus. Matthew chapter 15. Then came, G to, came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Skipping to chapter 15, verse 7. Jesus is speaking, You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. All your life you've heard that verse applied to some other church. And well it may be, but Jesus was speaking to the leaders of his church. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Jesus, did you realize you offended the leaders? How daft were these men? Are we any less? But Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. Woe to the pastors and to those who all they do is listen to them. Matthew chapter 16. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came. Remember, they're going to unite. Don't think to yourself, well, I only listen to Fulcrum. I only listen to the conservative side. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came. I, by the way, I'm not casting any shade at, at, at Fulcrum or saying anything bad. I'm just saying, just not just because someone says, well, I'm conservative. Oh, that, that if they say I'm biblical, say praise God. And then make sure they actually are. The Pharisees also came with the Sadducees, and tempting desired him that he should show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. There's a lot of Seventh-day Adventists waiting to see the Sunday law pass. And when we see that sign, we'll kick it in the air. Eternally too late. I meant to bring a pastor uh, a few weeks ago passed out one of the, uh, one of the, one of the handouts that he had. Uh, I wondered how many of us picked up the point that Again, when the Sunday law passes, it will be too late for Adventism. 
we're talking you know, talk about warning people, but if you read that closely, it makes clear, as is often the case, that when the little time of trouble begins, when a Sunday law is passed, when judgment moves from the dead to the living, it will be too late for those who should have known. Then the door of mercy will open. That's the time of ingathering, of harvest, for those who have not known. But we read those passages as if, okay, yeah, I see that, and then there's going to be a chance. But not for me. Matthew chapter 16, going down to verse 6, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Skipping down verse 11, because the disciples started asking him, Oh, did, 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 did we not take bread? How is it that you do not understand, Jesus said, that I spake to you not concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. How many times does he have to say it before it starts to get through their thick skull? But Jesus kept repeating it for you. Because he was not only worried about the thick skull of Peter, but of me. Of you. Matthew chapter 23. You should turn there and just read along with me. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 13. So we're going to read a long passage. These are Jesus' words, not mine, so don't throw them in. Matthew chapter 23, starting at verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you come past land and sea, sea and land, to make one proselyte, one convert, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, blind guides, which say, Whosoever sweareth by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind. Skipping to verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These you ought to have done, and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the platter, but within you are full of of extortion and excess, you blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Verse 28. Even so, you also outward appear, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres, the tombs of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Whereunto Jesus says, your witnesses unto yourselves, that you are the children of them which kill the prophets. Fill you up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. Those were the words of John. And they were the words of Jesus. And if we were going to make straight paths, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send, you, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Skipping to verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
that kills the prophets, that stones them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Once before, Jesus has cleansed his temple, and he said, you have made my father's house. But now, Jesus says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. When we started this message last week, I made something clear to you, I hope, from Hebrews chapter 5 or to Hebrews chapter 3 when Jesus says, Moses was faithful in his house. God, Jesus is faithful in his house, whose house you are. You are God's church. If you hold fast your confidence. What confidence and what? Confidence is the one who's able to save you from sin. That is God's house. But he looked at an organization and said, your house is left unto you desolate. Never mistake the distinction between an organization, a name, and God's house, God's church. Again, God uses the word, just like Paul says, all Israel will be saved, the remnant of Israel will be saved. Read and discern. He won't ask you what someone else thought, what someone else knew. Okay. Just in case you think it was Matthew, Mark chapter 8, verse 15. And Jesus charged them, saying, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. We touched on this last week, I think. The leaven of Herod? Why on earth would a good Jew be listening to anything Herod said? Well, there are a lot of Seventh-day Adventists these days who are listening to what Herod says. And they are listening to it and believing some of it hook, line, and sinker. And this is not a political statement. Said in Sabbath school with the kids this morning, I don't remember how it came up and exactly, but he was like, you know, I know Biden lies because I've seen his lips moving. And I know that Trump lied because, well, I saw his lips moving. So this is not about conservative liberal. This is about making sure that your truth comes out of God's word. And Jesus says, beware the leaven, the doctrine of the conservatives, the liberals, the scholars, the theologians, and the government. Respect all of them, but beware the leaven. Luke chapter 11. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Did you catch that? You are as graves, and the people who are walking over you are not aware that they're walking on dead men's bones. When you walk on the ground, you want it to be solid ground. Don't you? You don't want to be walking on dead men's bones, do you? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of that. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. Oh, well, us doctors of the law, the PhDs, the demons, you're insulting us as well. And Jesus said, Woe unto you also, you lawyers, doctors of the law, for you laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and you yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, lawyers, 
For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You've taken away what? The key of knowledge. You enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, lying, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. And in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Did anyone go home last week and look up that sermon from Conrad Vine? Did you find it? Yes, it's on YouTube. Conrad what? Conrad Vine, he's a doctor, he's a pastor, he's somewhat of a monkey muck, I guess, in that too. Not kind of boring. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. I He made a very simple point. I tried to look up last night quickly to see if I could verify the figures that he used, and I couldn't do it quickly, and so I just gave up. Because although lots of people are dogging the sermon, no one has refuted the facts laid out. Which are very simply that while the church is telling you to get a vax, to get a jab, while Seventh-day Adventists are being fired because the quote-unquote official statement on the church's website says that the issue of what you put in your body is not a matter of religious liberty. The simple fact is that tithe in, I don't know, I don't remember if this was North America or overall, North America provides most of the tithe. The tithe base is about a billion dollars, one billion dollars. But in 2019, and I did verify it on the website, it said 2019 was the last year for which figures were available. Uh, but you know that it's gone much, much higher in the era of COVID. That in 2019, the Adventist hospitals and so forth, who Lowland included, helped write that last official statement, they got about $20 billion in government payments. Now, the Supreme Court recently said that, you know, you couldn't mandate uh, the jab uh, for employers with more than 100 workers. But because the hospitals take so much federal money, i.e. Medicaid and Medicare, that you could mandate the, the health care workers to take it. Do you think that a $20 million might have something to do with the position? No. Beware the leaven of Herod. Is, folks, I bring these things out because Jesus said they shall become known. And so I'm not going to be ashamed. Folks, we need to understand what goes on. Because we need to pray for people and we need to make the difference that we can make. Okay? Now, he said, and this came up in, in Matthew as well, but I highlight it here. I guess you're not looking at, you're not looking at anything on the screen. But in Luke chapter 11, and I guess this is actually, this might be into chapter 12. He said to the lawyers, Woe to the lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. The doctors of the law, those who are smartest and have made the decisions for what the doctrine is, they have taken away the key of knowledge. Education, page 125. The central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan, the restoration of the human soul of the image of God. The burden of every book, the burden of every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme, man's uplifting, the power or grace of God, which, quote, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, quoting 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. He who grasps this thought, what thought? 
that every passage of the Bible is about the power of God to lift you out of sin and to push you back into the sinless position in which God created man. He who grasps this thought has before him an infinite field for study. He has the key that will unlock to him the whole treasure house of God's word. Because God's word everywhere is talking about the perfection of his saints. What? Have you ever seen anyone perfect? Says the most prolific writer in Adventism in the last 20 years. Yeah, I, I haven't. But God's word predicts it and prophesies it for the last generation. But you doctors have taken away the key by saying perfection is not possible. And again, these translations, we're looking at this in Hebrews right now. The King James Version says, God, whom God has perfected, but these other translations, whom he is perfecting, they are changing the word because they are taking away the key that opens heaven to you. This is serious business, folks. If men who walked and talked and slept and ate with Jesus Christ, their minds were befuddled, if you think you can just lollygag and just show up at church once a week and just you know read your morning watch and study your Sabbath school lesson and you can park your car in front of the church on Sabbath morning so you must be saved and you just got to tell someone else, it's just false. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it's, I'm making it too hard. Heaven will be cheap enough, folks. Heaven will be cheap enough. I'm waiting for someone to say amen. Heaven will be cheap enough. If I am making it too hard this morning, you don't understand what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. But you need to have a glimpse, catch a glimpse of it. Heaven is cheap enough, folks. I am... God is not asking you to do something too hard or to give up too much or to sacrifice. This is serious business, folks, and the devil is hard at work. And we're told that men carrying the torch of Satan will stand in these pulpits. Not in pulpits on Sunday morning, pulpits on Sabbath morning. Okay? And so you better be aware the leaven of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and Herod. And the doctors of the law who are setting our doctrine and taking away the key. And again, I mentioned this last week, but again, that's one of the things that was confirmed only a few weeks ago. Almost no one at the seminary believes in perfection. And the key has just been taken out of the law and thrown away. And you better go find it. These are not my words, and I'm going to read it verbatim without comment by God's grace. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 9 to 11. All you beasts of the field and come to devour, yea, all you beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. I'm going to skip Jeremiah chapter 2, but again, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 26 to 28, there's specific time, reference to the time of trouble. We think this is an Adventist construct. We think this is a Ellen White construct. This is straight out of God's Word. I guess I shouldn't have skipped it because we're back to Isaiah chapter 56. I'm now going to read you verses 10 to 12 out of the New Living Translation. 
For the leaders of my people, the Lord's watchmen, his shepherds, are blind and ignorant. They are like silent watchdogs that can give no warning when danger comes. They love to lie around, sleeping and dreaming. Like greedy dogs, they are never satisfied. They are ignorant shepherds, all following their own path and intent on personal gain. Come, they say, let us get some wine and have a party. Let's all get drunk. Then tomorrow we'll do it again and have an even bigger party. Drunk with the wine of the doctrine, the leaven of Babylon. Hosea chapter 4, verses 6 to 9, I'm again reading from the New Living Translation. My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Since you priests refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priests. Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will forget to bless your children. The more priests there are, the more they sin against me. They have exchanged the glory of God for the shame of idols. When the people bring their sin offerings, the priests get fed. So the priests are glad when the people sin. And what the priests do, the people also do. So now I will punish both priests and the people for their wicked deeds. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. The original namesake for what I thought would be one sermon. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. This morning, if you are a baby Christian, if you are a baby Seventh-day Adventist, desire the sincere milk of the word. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 to 14 and we close here. For when for the time you ought to be teachers you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Even those who by reason of use, use of what? Use of the word of God. They've been listening to Jesus, to the word of God that came to Jeremiah, and now when they hear fatal sophistry, when they hear insinuations that are not true. Because by reason of using the word of God, they have not been drinking milk, predigested food from someone else to nourish them. Because you may be a baby Christian, and you should desire the sincere milk of the word, but as you grow up into Christ, you do not need mother's milk. You need to study the Word of God for yourself. And when you do it, then you will discern between good and evil. Next time, if I stand before you, I hope to have a much more pleasant message. No, I, I, the way of salvation is clear in God's word, but, but the key has been taken away. Um, and again, I took you to Jeremiah. I took you to Matthew. I took you to the desire of ages. And I showed you page after page that Jesus was very intent on making sure his people got a certain message. That message is not spoken in the church. And, and would you expect the priests and the Pharisees and rabbis to come and give you this message? Yeah. But God's people need the message. Because we are not smarter than the disciples. We are not smarter than Jesus' brothers. Heavenly Father, 